All right, it's 10 a.m. on Thursday, March 3rd. The meeting of the Public Safety Committee will come to order. In attendance is uh, Council Members Rusty Streetman, Blair Hahn, and myself, Jan Anderson. Um, we'd like to acknowledge that the press and the public have been duly notified of the meeting in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act. I don't see any citizens here for public comment. Oh, what? Okay. So, um, Chair, we need to approve the previous meetings pre minutes. Previous meetings minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the special meeting for February 10th. Any comments? Move to approve. I, I have a couple of comments. So, I'm just waiting for y'all. Um, very brief. Our consultant is named Jennifer Beal, B I H L. If anyone wants to look up her credentials online, you need to have the proper spelling. Um, and the second comment was um, in the middle of it, or at the very end of comment about page. But anyway, um, she is not conducting a study. She is to advise IOP, City of IOP, and review the SCDOT study. So that's just at the end, just to make that change. Um, I don't have any other comments. Anyone else? No, oh, ma'am. Nope. Okay. So. As amended. Okay. As amended, do we need to vote on it? Okay. You proposed, you proposed that they be accepted right. in discussion. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. As, as amended. As amended. Yeah. Aye. Okay. All right, now we'll do citizen comments and yeah. there are- okay. Sorry, April, sorry, the 17th. No, the 17th, the regular meeting. Sorry, I'll get this right. Um, February 17th. Uh, Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Uh, None. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, citizen comments now. <laughs> and there are no citizens, so we won't have any comments. Um, Let's have our highlights of our de departmental reports, starting with Interim Chief Briscoe. Thank you. And it's always a privilege to take a few minutes of your time. And I certainly uh, would like for you to take a look at the report. It has been submitted. I would like to take a little bit of personal privilege to talk about item three on the second page, uh, instead of hitting all of them. This one, the, the one on 2-12-22, where Fire Marshal Stafford set up at our wonderful Doggy Days event, mm -hmm. put on by the Isle of Palms. Uh, I don't know where I have to get Miss Amy, but can the folks at home, how do I need to get that? This is what uh, Stafford, went and purchased to give to our citizens that wanted that. And you folks at home can see this, but this is to be put at the bottom of the door or on a window so that we as firefighters, when we're inside your house searching, that we'll know you've got a pet in there and that we can come in and, and search. So I've got one for each of you, whether you've got a pet or not, you may can, uh, you make a gift one sister. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, nice. Good. Got several. Good, 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 good. So that that went over real well. We gave out almost 60 of those. And that that, that was pretty cool because I think Chief and, and he talked about it already. I don't know if you'll speak on it anymore, but they they signed up almost 60 or registered almost 60 animals that day. So that's, that's pretty good. So good. we were, we were very excited about that. Now, the question you may get is why don't we do that with uh, they've got sticker called top fighters. And here's my thought on it. And it's just opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody's got one. So, so my opinion is that I wouldn't want a sticker on my granddaughter's window to show the bad guys where she sleeps. Now, what they do have, and it's something that, that you may want Travis to look at in the future, is inside the door, inside the house, when our guys are searching and going from room to room, 
there is a little indicator that you can put at the bottom of the door that, uh, that the firefighter can see okay. or feel if the visibility is zero, which a lot of times it is, he can feel the, that there is something there. So that indicates to him that there is a- Chief, are those available? Job. Yes, sir, they are. And now, we, we don't have them yet. Oh, okay. okay. We, we can if that's a decision that we, oh, okay. we make. So and just keep that in mind in the future. Right. You know, and, Decals. Do you have more of those? We do, and we would love for you to come by and see Miss Lynn as you come in the public safety building. Uh, see Miss Lynn on the fire side. Uh, we have a police receptionist and a fire receptionist, and if they'll they'll come right over there, she'll be glad to give them one. Or if they see Travis, or if they'll see the city administrator and say, "Hey, I need some stickers," we'll get them to them. Right? Yes. And another uh, just point to make that we've been increasing the participation of the fire department specifically. We've Historically, had the police department participate in special events. Um, we, for the you know, since Chief Briscoe has been um, with us, we have made it a point to have a um, dedicated area for both police and fire staff during okay. special events, where this kind of information could be disseminated. Um, and that that would be the plan. That would be another opportunity for us to 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 meet our community where they are. Correct, like on Front Beach uh, Saturday. We'll, we'll have a table set up. We always do now. And they'll be giving these away to people that all they got to do is ask for them. And that's just a service that you provide. I got I've got to say that the uh, doggy days event was well done by the yeah. rec center, and by the, the public safety department. Uh, well Norma Jean does a great job. But You're all, exactly all right. It's great event. It, it is. It, it's it. fabulous. As I said, this is my last meeting, so I, I, I want to leave just with uh, a couple things, a personal privilege if the administrator will allow me. Uh, I've been getting a lot of questions, so I'm assuming you're getting a lot of questions about the staffing and uh, NFPA and things at the fire department. So I, I'd like to tell you, number one, that, that your fire department's in good shape. Um, Matter of fact, the insurance service office, ISO, rates fire departments in the United States. They classify them 10 being the lowest unprotected, one being the highest most protected. Um, exemplary, I think, is their, their terms. Uh, I don't know if you know what your fire department is rated. Nope. It's rated to class one. Oh. There's 46 thousand fire departments in the United States. A little over 200 of them are class ones. Excellent. We at Isle of Palms are. That's right. It's the first class one fire department I've ever had the opportunity to work in. So I'm, I'm very proud of that. And we've had that des designation for a couple Since of years. 2017. 17, and we've maintained it yes. every, every year since then. And, and, and it's hard to get it, but it's even harder to maintain. Yeah. To, to, to put it in perspective for our folks at home, there are about 458 fire departments in South Carolina. Around 29, and some of the fact checkers will have to check me out on Facebook, but, but around 29 are class one in South Carolina. And again, we are one. And so that, that's, that's pretty impressive. That says that we provide to our citizens at Isle of Palms exemplary fire protection. Now that says a lot for us. So we've been graded on everything from response times to response numbers, to um, uh, communications, to home inspections, to smoke detectors. We are, by the way, designated again by the state of South Carolina. And we have to go through this once a year, a fire safe community. There's not many of those either, but Isle of Palms is one. We are, and we have to we have to meet that every year, so that's that's pretty cool. Well, thank uh, you I, for helping us maintain that oh, I, rating I, while you were here. No, that was very I, that that uh, I can't take any of the credit for any anything. Your administrator, your your staff, uh, your fire department administration, your fire department staff. Those are the ones that that will do good. And you'll have the opportunity today to, uh, or this afternoon, I think, to, to meet two of the candidates that, that Ms. Fergoso has narrowed down. And 
I'm going to tell you, I, I'm, I'm really impressed. You're going to be left in, in good hands. But as I've told Ms. Fergoso, anytime that I can help the Isle of Palms, all you got to do is call. Okay. And she has my number. <laughs> so, but I do appreciate it. But, but, you know, take the good with the bad. You're, you're going to hear a lot of negative things about your fire department. You're going to hear a lot of positive things about your fire department. So just kind of kind of look at it in the middle. You got a you got a good you got a great fire department here. So and so just just keep that in mind. And if you ever need any information, please contact. Don't mind at all to help you out. And are we fully staffed now? Is we that, are. Okay. We are. Uh, I hate to say that in front of Chief <laughs> because well. he, he's fixing to tell you, but but and not only are we fully staffed but it's probably every day either I or Janice gets a call about somebody wanting to come here to be a firefighter. So that's, that speaks, again, volumes. We're, we're doing something right. You, you're doing something right. So that's, that's great. You people at home are doing something right. Because, again, I'm a taxpayer at Oak Island, North Carolina. And do I need 10 more firemen at Oak Island? Sure. Do I need them here? Sure. Do I need 20 more? Sure. Do I need 30? Sure. Do I need 40? Sure. Do I want to pay the taxes on that? No. <laughs> Not in Oak Island, I don't. So we have to we have to give the city options. What what can we do? So if if I had a chance to talk to your candidates this afternoon, I would look at mutual aid because they call them the Fab Five, Fab Five, I think, across the bridge uh, in the Charleston area. And they, they all run mutual aid. They all back each other up. And I was surprised when I came here that, that we just started working on that pretty heavy, uh, Ms. Fergoso and myself, because I feel like that that's a very important player in getting to meeting our needs, whether it's automatic mutual aid or mutual aid, so that the backs of the taxpayers are not just on and on and on. But again, that's personal preference. I, it's been a pleasure. If I can help you in any way in the future, Please let me know. Ma'am, thank you for allowing me this person. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Thank you so thank much you for, for your service. Oh, thank you, ma'am. All right, Chief Cornett, what you got for us? So, uh, good, morning. good morning. Good morning. You could see all the significant events. Uh, I do want to give a special shout out and thank you to everyone who helped us with the polar plunge. I will say after last month's meeting, I put a little plug in there and I'm happy to say that we took second place overall um, and compared to the size of Mount Pleasant, the number of people they have participating and, and helping with that, uh, it, they raised a lot of money, but overall the, the common goal was to raise money for Special Olympics and we, we raised well over $25,000 for Special Olympics in South Carolina. Uh, and it was cold water, but it was well worth it to to be able to give to Special Olympics because that goes straight to the Olympians. It goes straight to making sure that they can participate. Um, and there was a lot of support from our council uh, making that happen. And I certainly appreciate that. We did do a virtual coffee with a cop. Uh, it was pretty, pretty well attended online. Uh, we're happy to say that we're getting ready in next month to do in-person coffee with a cop. And we've got some other things planned. Um, I already talked last month about the first responder of the month for Officer Ambus. He was recognized by the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. And other than that, you can see our stats. They are lower than they were last year at this time. Our calls were down, our arrests were down. Actually, I think arrests were roughly about the same, a little down, but uh, which is good. You know, in our charges, you can look on the second pages. The one to talk about would be our vacancies. And we do see that beach service officers have a quite a few vacancies. I am happy to say that we received numerous applications over the last couple of weeks and we've started doing interviews. So we're looking to fill some of those as quick as we can. And we've started, we reached out and talked with some representatives from the Citadel too. And I think uh, we talked to some of their staff in the school and they're gonna help us get some more BSOs through them as well. Uh, police officers, we still have three vacancies in the department and we have had a couple of interviews. We've got some that are going further through the background check, and uh, I, we have more than enough applicants to fill that those okay. three positions. Cool. Uh, and my hope is that we will have them filled as quickly as we can. We do have two that are in the academy. They are over halfway done, so uh, we're expecting <coughs> them back, uh, I think, towards the end of this month. Uh, they should be graduating from the academy, and then they'll start field training. Okay, excellent. 
other than that, all stats were lower. So are there any questions? Chief, uh, oh, how many BSOs do we keep on staff in the shoulder season, off season, basically? We try to keep, this year we kept two. We try to keep one or two during the off season, right. uh, depending on what it is. Our code enforcement kind of helps out with some of those during the off season too. And we did in increase it this past off season because it was still relatively busy. We, there were a lot of events taking place and we really needed them, but that's typically it's one or two. Okay. I bet your code, your code enforcement officer staying busy these days, isn't he? He stays busy <laughs> quite often. <laughs> and it's Those that time of year where it starts to pick up. So yeah. yeah. Good job. Thank you all. Right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Thank you Chief. Thank you, Chief. All right. Um, moving on to O business, we have an update on the study of the modifications to the Isle of Palms connector to include assessment of alternatives, configurations to improve traffic flow, pedestrian emergency access, and expanded scope for corridor study. Um, we don't have a lot to update um, on this since our last special meeting and the report given to council. We do have a meeting, the kickoff meeting scheduled for tomorrow, which will be attended by the staff and SADOT staff, um, including the consultant that's been hired by SADOT to conduct the study and the traffic engineer consultant that will be representing us in these discussions. So we're looking forward to that discussion. We have shared with SADOT the city's input and not only the, the, the scope for the first phase of the project, but also the expanded sc uh, scope for the corridor study. And we're looking forward to having that sort of in-person discussion um, tomorrow to talk about deliverables and what kind of data we wanna see um, as part of this initiative. So um, I'm we'll be happy to report um, after the tomorrow's meeting um, how it went. Okay, and we have a phase one and phase two scope that we're talking about for that, right? That's correct. The, but the meeting tomorrow, you know, we'll talk about both scopes, but it's mostly geared towards the first phase. Okay, getting that um, started. Getting that start, getting that uh, piece started. Okay, excellent. Des Desiree, uh, do, we, do we have any update on the county park situation in regards to parking, ingress, egress, if they can change that so that people can pay up on exit rather than ingress? Um, we held a meeting with their with their operational staff, including um, the executive director um, about a week or two ago. We met on site at the park and expressed our concerns and, and the challenges that we're seeing that our uh, patrol officers and police department are seeing um, with the stacking that happens um, in the mornings, you know, as people try to get into the county park, um, we spent quite a, quite some time with them, and we heard that some of the challenges that they have in making some changes to that to the to the operations. Um, we ultimately we um, agreed on splitting the cost of a Charleston County deputy um, officer that will be. Um, dedicated to manning the light of the connector and also assisting with the, um, not manning the light, but in that intersection and also assisting, assisting the um, egress and ingress and egress from the county park and that those costs will be shared 50-50 between the city and the county park. So they've um, committed to, to covering half of the expense. Um, they are looking into um, mobile payment systems, um, whether or not they would be ready to deploy a different uh, uh, payment of uh, POS system um, this summer. Uh, it doesn't seem likely. Um, it, you know, they express concerns about paying, having members pay as they leave because of the stacking and the congestion that forms inside their parking lot. Um, and, you know, we, we talked at length, you know, about what strategies there might be available to assist that. Um, there seems to be some resistance or re reluctancy from the, from, the, from the folks there to change what they're currently working on. So I think there's, there's still opportunity for continued discussion and collaboration and, and, and I guess um, 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 just, just to 
hope, hope for her openness, I guess, in, in trying different strategies moving forward, because certainly it's, it's a, it's a common theme where whenever we have talks about transportation and, and, and the challenges that we see here, um, a lot of it has to do with, with that, with that system and, and the impact that it does to the intersection. So we're going to continue those conversations. I think it's a good first step that we're going to be working on having a dedicated um, um, officer there um, that not only will assist in the challenges and that in, in, in the entrance to the county park, but the overall intersection. So um, that's going to be something included in the budget. Um, but that's hopefully that answers your question. Chief, is there anything I missed, didn't say, should say? I could ask if, if the county refuses to take responsibility for their traffic mess, do we have options through the police department? Do, do we have law enforcement op options, Chief, if, if the county it continues to create backup on our streets and refuses to take responsibility for it? So what we have done in the past to address that backup and the backup typically occurs that has a significant impact for us at 14th and Palm, right there where the connector comes to an end. That's why in the past summers, you have seen us block that road so that traffic could not go that way because that intersection is crucial for us to keep open for emergency response. So that's what we've done in the past. That's what we would continue to do. If, and even with the, with the deputy at that light, if it got to the point that it was stacking and we couldn't move it because this is traffic coming from all over the island that's either trying to leave or come on. Uh, and there's still a chance that that could occur. And we would still block off 14th Avenue uh, to prevent that from happening. In turn, what happens though, it does increase the stacking on Ocean Boulevard in the front beach area. Uh, but that's typically a high traffic area anyways. And it is better for us to have that busy and backed up than it is to have that intersection become blocked. Do we have any law enforcement options against the county for creating the traffic not to my knowledge yeah that's that's not Thank something you. we've looked into certainly we can um you know one of the things that they are very concerned about is customer service and their ability to properly direct um, people as they come in and, and be able to provide the right information um they also you know express concerns about you know you know, when there's the mass exodus that we see all over the island, when there's a storm, an afternoon storm, or where, when everybody wants to leave um, at five o'clock, four o'clock, that it there's a lot of stacking inside the parking lot, and then people get frustrated. And if they have to pay when they when they're leaving, you know, most of the staff that they hire to manage the parking lot and the operations are high school students or you know young people, young kids. And whether or not they are properly prepared to address a situation with somebody that's been on their car waiting for two hours and then needs to pay, so that there's a concern about that. Um, and so, again, we're we're trying to encourage that conversation to see if there are ways to mitigate that. Um, their their customers are certainly our customers as well. We want people that come to the county park to have an enjoyable experience, but it certainly becomes a public safety. Um, issue when we have that backup on our streets, our streets that should really be um, so cleared clearly. It's yeah. a ma main intersection and should be cleared in order for um, for for you know large apparatus to be able to go through in the event, event of an emergency. Um, so we're we're going to continue those conversations and provide um, support as necessary. Um, I think you know, we're, we're gonna have to look at what options do we have um, if it continues to be a problem. Because frankly, you know, we, we don't know how effective having a an officer there dedicated to that intersection, how effective it'll be um, because there is a lot of congestion. Um, so, so again, we're at the staff level, that's a huge priority for us to try to develop a, a strategy to address that. But any any help, Certainly any um, push, encouragement from elected officials certainly helps. Um, I do, you know, the, the county park staff is absolutely wonderful to work with. They've, they've been there for a long time and have a great knowledge and 
Um, we just want to continue to encourage a conversation about doing, trying something different. Um, they are, I will say, they are um, increasing the rates during the weekends for parking. Um, it's currently $15 Saturdays and Sundays, and they are going up to $20 um, on the weekends. And their, their um, goal with that is to encourage less visitation during the weekends and more during the week. Um, again, a lot of the you know, working families can't come in the week. So I don't think there's a lot of people that don't have a, an option to come okay. to the beach, but on the weekend. So, um, but I believe they've had some success with that in, um, strategy during the holiday, fest the festival of lights. However, that's a night, nighttime event. Yeah. Um, so we're, 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 I guess we're going to continue to try, but, but um, it has, we have been unsuccessful so far in, in, they're having them change that system. Yeah. There are plenty of options um, with all kinds of apps now available, as well as having something at a kiosk or whatever. And I will say that from that perspective, one of the so right now they have no spillage. Everybody coming in through that through that gate pays. There is there is a, a spillage, I guess, that you have to accept when you have sort of an honor system when it comes to kiosks. We we you know we have that because we. That's how we manage our parking lots. Yeah. That's why we have enforcement. They don't have the same enforcement capability that we would have. Um, so I, I think that there's uh, there's a concern about revenues associated with a different system that that doesn't ensure that people pay, you know, as they come in. The, the question to ask is whether the spillage is offset by the, the fact that you don't have to pay personnel to man the, the lot anymore. So that I know in, in uh, other areas, in fact, in Charlotte, they don't even have fare collectors on their transit system anymore because it's cheaper to do periodic checking mm -hmm. and, um, and not to, to have full-time personnel to do that. They have somebody that walks through the train maybe every now and then checking for fare busters. Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty much any business that accommodates the public in any way is going to have spillage or shrink. Yeah, I, I mean, mean you don't want one hundred percent. It's inherently it's inefficient in, in, in the business model, basically. Yeah. To me, that's up to them to figure out. And for yeah. customer service, customer service is not a one-way street. This is no reflection on our city administrator, our, our law enforcement, public safety people at all. But they need to be more. They need to sharpen their pencil, I think, yeah. and, and come to the table with better solutions for us because the number of vehicles that's coming across that connector, we already know that it's heavy and it's going to be even heavier this year because population is not decreasing around the low country. And uh, uh, I intend to make a call. I, I know at least one person down there that's on the, on the staff, I think probably the executive director. I don't know if that will do any good or not, but I think that they certainly should come to the table with us and, uh, and try to find solutions rather than just sort of maybe we can do this, maybe we can do that, or maybe or 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 looking at it really, I think with a glass half empty approach rather than glass half full, and trying to find some solutions. So, you know, I'm all for us trying different things, and if we have to do that for you know initially, then then fine. But I, I just I honestly don't think that what's been offered up so far could be anywhere close to yeah. any any positive solution for us. I agree with Councilman Streetman that we need to shift the argument. The argument isn't this is our fault and our problem. The, the argument is, is they've created the situation. They need to fix it. And we don't need to pay to fix it. We don't need to figure out how to fix it. They do. And if we can't take that type of an approach with them, then we'll need to look at legal options. Uh, I'm sure that there are legal options. This isn't the first time in the history of South Carolina something like this has happened. So we have other options. We just need to figure out what they are and force them if they refuse to take responsibility for themselves. And, and raising the rate on the weekend just forces more parking up and down Palm and elsewhere. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to come here. It's going to be here. We all know that. And we know we're going to have afternoon thunderstorms occasionally. And everybody's going to want to leave at the same time. But, you know, that's not something you can plan for week to week. It just happens when it happens. And, and uh, I mean, I, 
I really think that there ought to be an all out effort on the county's part to do everything they can to serve their customer that's here, which is Isle of Palms municipality, and, and also the many visitors that come in for the day uh, yeah. on the island to, to get them to get them in and out as quickly as possible. And I just don't buy the argument of, of, of traffic by stacking up in the park. It's stack, stacking up in the park. Stacking up in the park, it would be outside, outside the gate stacking up, and, and, and if you have that situation, it's going to be basically crowded everywhere. So, a um, couple of things. First of all, let's make sure if they're raising rates in the county park, that we make sure everybody knows it's the county raising rates and not Isle of Palms, and so that can blow back on us pretty fast. The second thing is we may be able to have a partner in Mount Pleasant because they complain about traffic backing up on the connector in the mornings, on the weekends, all the way down the rifle range. You can't up, get up and down rifle range. So if we need another voice to complain, I don't know if they do much else than that, but that's an idea. Yeah, we went, when we had a, a follow-up conversation with the leadership in Mount Pleasant and mm -hmm. Sullivan's Island following our meeting with the county, we talked about certainly the challenge that we have with the system at the county park and they all agreed and we all discussed having some type of joint effort to mm -hmm. essentially put more pressure on um, on having something something different yeah. um, to address the stacking. Um, another thing to think about too is the time when they open. You know, a lot of the issue is people People want to get here early. They want to get their parking spot. So you start getting that stacking when the when the county park's not open. So a consideration for opening a little bit earlier would be helpful. Um, and that's something that's been requested as well. Um, and they did did indicate that in the busy weekends they do they don't advertise that they're going to open up earlier, but they do open up earlier to address that stacking. So I, I agree with all of you. Any you know support from elected officials is always helpful um, in 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 communicating sort of the the, the challenges that we're trying to address. Um, one last thing too is that county police officer that's going to be watching the traffic at the at the signal is just going to be doing that watching the traffic. There's not much he can do because the situation is not the way the intersection works. It's the way the park works. However, if we, if we went to a new fair structure system at the park and they were worried about enforcement, that, that county officer would be better served enforcing parking at the, you know, giving out tickets at the county park because our officers can't ticket the park. So maybe what we've gotten is halfway there with an officer at least assigned to us. And now we got to solve the problem, which is what we do at the park. Thank you. It's, I, I hope your phone call is helpful. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions, any other comments about old business? Okay, under new business, um, Blair, would you like to tell us the status of this uh, letter to the South yeah, Carolina I, DOT? I believe that um, Section 6A is just in the era that that has been sent to the full council. I know that a draft letter is being worked on uh, with administration, uh, and that will be presented to the full council, the next full council. So I don't think there's anything that we need to do with it today. Okay, thank you. All right, and the last is the FY23 operation budget for police and fire. All right. In your packets, you have a copy of both the police and fire department's operational um, budget, including all funds. Um, we'll get started with the fire department general fund. Salaries and fringes, wages and fringes, it's were about 3% higher than budget FY22. Um, you can see there for salary for line item six, there's about a $14,000 increase that's associated with the um, wage adjustments that were included, that were implemented in um, citywide 1122. 
Um, the reason that number is not as high, the, 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 the fiscal impact of those wage adjustments is higher than that. But compared to the budget in FY22, we included about $150,000 to support any restructuring and the creation of a deputy chief position. So there's some there's some spillover there that we're seeing it's not impact that's why it's not impacting FY23 so much. Um, if retirement expense it's it's a line item that's really driving this increase in the fire department the um, retirement contribution for uh, public safety is higher than for other employees and that number is 21 24 21 point 24 percent. Um, that number increased 1% from last year, it used to be 20.24%. 20, 20 20 um, <coughs> the employee contribution, it's 9.75%. Um, we have received indication from PIBA that that retirement um, contra employer contribution will stay at this rate for the next few years. That's something that we do not control, PIBA does but we anticipate this number not increasing and stabilizing for, for a few years. Um, I'll go down and unless there's any specific questions to um, line 17, there's a $2,400 um, increase there to allow um, for, a, was there any question? No? Oh, I heard something, okay. Um, to allow for just additional admin expense associated with our new fire chief. Um, we're in the process of evaluating our IT budget, whether you know, computers need to be replaced. So that, that provision is meant to be used for that. Um, meetings and seminars, there's a slight increase there, about three to $3,400. Um, we've included about 2,400 of that for our fire inspector, fire marshal to attend a conference. This is something that I've, I've been working on um, instilling a culture in all, across departments for people um, to, to attend conferences and attend professional development opportunities. Um, I think it's important in professional development. I think it's important that you learn a lot, you network a lot, and you realize that a lot of the problems that we're dealing with, somebody is either dealing with them or have dealt with them. So there's a, there's a, a real value in, in doing that. And, um, in the past, sort of, you know, executive level administrative staff always participated, but I think there's a huge opportunity here for um, to expand that across across the board. And we've done it for the past year, and I think people really enjoy it. Um, and we've we've um, received dividends from that, so that's something that I want to continue. Then you'll see throughout the budget um, some some um, expenses associated with uh, requests from the fire marshal's office. I'm sure you recall Chief Briscoe talks about this all the time, that that office, that position saves more lives um, because of, of the um, focus and being proactive um, with, with uh, fire protection. Um, it is an indispensable role and we wanna elevate that and really strengthen that with resources for them to do even better than what they've done. Um, so you'll see some, some line items there, uh, for example, we, you know, with meetings and seminars, we'll, we're including some funds there um, and for some additional tools throughout other line items. Um, vehicle and fuel, we've increased that line item by about 5,000. We've seen an increase obviously <laughs> with what's going on in the world with fuel and diesel and unleaded numbers. Um, you know, During public works, we had this discussion. We actually think that this might be too low. We're gonna have to review that with, with current numbers. So that, again, this is the first draft. We may be, you may be seeing other numbers um, in the, in the uh, next version. Line 25, IT equipment, software, and services. The addition here of 7,500,000 compared to last year's budget is for a digital dashboard for, for um, daily reporting. Um, one of the things that we heard from our fire department um, recently was uh, a desire for improving communications across shifts. Um, mm -hmm. So the department currently prepares a daily report, which is absolutely wonderful. Deputy Chief Hathaway has been working on that, but it's really time consuming. Um, and this would be a tool that would help facilitate that and expedite the development of that daily reporting 
and even expand upon what we currently have and um, be able to push out information to the shifts and the personnel before they go out on a certain call. There's opportunity here to um, add pictures or information about the house that they're where they're responding to. So this is a, a request that's new for this year that I support and it's included in this first draft um, for council to consider as well. Okay. Um, unless there are any questions, I'm just gonna touch on the highlights. Uh, maintenance and service contract, line 27. Here we've included a new firefighting foam that um, covers all classes of fire. That's a $3,200 expense. Um, this, this, it's a new type of foam that our fire department is requesting um, that they use. And it, re it, it um, requires use of less water during, during um, firefighting um, situations. Um, it doesn't produce the scalding steam that water does. So it's safer for our folks. Um, and um, it has been proven to reduce injuries associated with firefighting. So. Um, Chief, if I missed anything, if you need to expand on that, um, this is a, a sort of a, a, a new thing that's in, in a best practice that, that we want to make sure that our firefighters um, have the, the, the yeah. you know, the best equipment and the best um, um, resources to, to fight fires effectively while, you know, hopefully reducing potential injuries. Yes, absolutely. Please do. Mount Pleasant has recently went to that, so it is a proven foam. The other one mm -hmm. had a had a dribble up has got a a relationship with some carcinogens. So again, we're trying to keep play things safe. Okay. And right now, there are different types of phones for different types of fires. Mm -hmm. This is one that could be used across the board, um, which is again. Um, would serve um, significant efficiencies. Um, professional, I'm sorry, employee training line 34, you can see there that we've increased that um, slightly. That is another line item that's been adjusted to, a, to account for additional fire marshal training by about 2,500,000. Miscellaneous and contingency, we added $2,000. That's line item 36. We're at $9,000, an increase of $3,000 from previous, previous years. And that is to um, um, allow for the purchase of additional fire prevention materials, educational materials, sort of like the stickers that Chief Frisco showed you, um, mm -hmm. resources that we can use to uh, pr promote fire, fire safety in our community um, in special events. So there's an increase uh, that's one of the, um, you know, tasks that I've given the department. I want to see more community um, community um, connection by the department, and this is something to support those efforts. The kids' helmets, is that helmets you just give away to kids? Yes. They're, they're plastic really helmets. They're yeah. adorable. We'll get you one, Rusty. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's why I asked the question. <laughs> you want one, huh? <laughs> All right, um, going, going down to capital projects, non-capital tools and equipment. This budget includes the purchase of two 50 gallon cabinets for uh, storing um, flammable materials. Um, that's $3,000 and that would be for us to equip each station with one um, flammable, um, uh, one cabinet. Um, it also includes a pickup truck toolbox for the fire marshal's truck. Um, this would allow him to, to, to have the equipment that he needs for inspections and the, you know all the work that he does on the truck securely without having to bring it back and forth um, between the station and his truck. So we've included that. Another request from the department that I have included is a rescue drone for about $4,000. This is something that, um, I think would be really helpful to um, to the department when they're responding, particularly to calls on the beach. Um, it would help them quickly deploy and have a, an aerial view of, of the area, whether it's a missing child or um, a swimmer in distress. Um, I think that that's a, a, a great tool that, um, that, that I think we would be better for it by having. 
Yeah, in place of a helicopter, we can use a drone. That's a good idea. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, that's yeah. a good point. Okay. Yes. Be better than just hovering over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, what can you do? All right, we'll go to the next page. Capital outlay in line 53. We have 71,500 in FY23 budget, and that includes 25% of the cost to purchase a second set of bunker gear for all personnel. So we're splitting that four ways. Um, state aid tax, 25%, muni aid tax, 25%, capital projects, 25%, and hospitality tax, 25%. That's a nightmare for Laura upstairs, but uh, we feel like we can certainly justify um, impact of, um, of that across our tourism funds as well. Um, we've included the replacement of the light tower for engine 1001 and the replacement of our carbon monoxide monitor only with failure. Muni tax. There you can see on line item 63, the 25% for the second set of bunker gear at 34,000. Same thing in hospitality tax under non-capital tools and equipment. There's an increase there for $25,000. And that includes, um, again, the uh, an annual provision for bunker gear. So that's as needed. That's something that we have every, every budget year. Um, if we have a new uh, employee and they can't use an existing set of bunker gear because it's smaller or larger, then we would purchase that um, for them under that, under this line. We've also included um, $15,000 to, um, for hose and appliances. And this would include um, replacing all the nozzles for all the hand lines. Then we've also included in that line item 12,500 12, for the um, replacement and upgrade of the foam setup. So this is actually, the, not the foam, but where the foam comes out of. Capital outlay under hospitality tax. Here you can see the um, some items that were included in the 10-year capital plan that we discussed last month. Um, $42,000 for the replacement of one Ford, uh, Ford F-150. And this is where you can see the replacement of NATV with a pickup truck that we talked about last, um, last month as well. One new item in FY23 under not, uh, capital outlay at the, in the hospitality tax fund is a um, two bunker gear dryers for $20,000. And that um, would allow a quicker deployment of bunker gear after they're, they're cleaned. They can, we can get them dry quick, quick car, <laughs> even though they're gonna have two. Um, that's just something that I think it's a best practice to have. And this would furnish both stations with, with one with one dryer. Fire department 1% fund. This is a um, taxpayer funded source for fire departments in South Carolina to provide additional benefits for its members. Um, it's not meant, it cannot be used to cover any operational costs that the city would, would be responsible regardless. Um, so typically, historically the department has used that, the, the funds that are um, received through that uh, which is pay, paid by the taxpayer. It's part of your ins your property insurance premium. A, a percentage of that goes to uh, fire departments in South Carolina. And that's a, a, a source of money that our folks have used for supplemental retirement benefits. Um, it's there, the department has to agree. There has to be a vote on whatever they use that money um, for. Um, they've also used it to purchase TVs and they pay a portion of the, their cable bill from that fund. They also um, have bought, have purchased recliners, t-shirts, hats, um, that sort of thing. Um, but you know, typically I think for past several years, they've used it to for supplemental retirement. So they have a, a, a 401 type plan um, that, that they can use um, and fund through that money. And approximately they get a, a, about 4,000, 4,100 thousand um, dollars a year and that's across the board all personnel same amount um, for for that um, additional benefit now is that 
Is that something that's, when you say that they could use it in different ways, is that something they can draw from immediately? Or is it something that is just in the fund and it just continues to grow and accumulate interest? Um, it's, the chief, do you, can you answer that? Because I'm not, I'm not sure. You might want to get to the microphone. Chief. Yes, please. Just to make sure. For, for retirement purposes, it, 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 uh, it grows for somebody that may have 28 years here with the Isle of Palms. Uh, they could have as much as $100,000 that they will get it at a, at, a, at a lump sum when they retire. And it, it's it's just a retirement investment. Uh, as Ms. Fergoso has said, uh, insurance is sold across South Carolina as insurance is in, in North Carolina, we called it one half percent fund. It's one half of 1% of all fire and lightning insurance that's sold. And that money can be used uh, as, as she said, and it can build to my retirement, but I can also, and for the folks at home and the taxpayers here on the Isle of Palms, uh, for the past few years, the internet service on the third floor where the firefighters live has come out of that 1% fund because that is something that they use that is not provided by the city, nor should it be, that they can. Uh, they can play their games or watch whatever they want to, or they can do whatever they want to with that. So, so it has a dual purpose, as Ms. Fergoso said. It can be used for retirement, and it can build, or it can be used for an immediate purchase that the city does not really allow for, that the taxpayers really don't need that burden. So, so we can we can help them out with that. Thank you, Chief. That's perfect. Yeah. Yes, Thank you. and yeah. so and every year they have to develop a budget of how they they. Right. Of a proposed spending that money, and it has to be approved by a majority of the of the staff. That's a good benefit. Yeah. No other department has that, so that's uh, pretty pretty cool. So this this does not extend to the police department. No, sir. All right, we go down to state accommodations tax. Um, here you can see we we um, use state accommodations tax revenue for. Um, the debt service of the new 75 foot ladder truck. You can see there the principal and interest statements on that. And then capital outlay here, we have the replacement of one um, jet ski at 18,000, replacement of a utility ATV vehicle for beach patrol. And here you can see the 25% um, uh, of the cost of the bunker gear, second set of bunker gear. All right, any questions with fire before I go to police? All right. Same, same concept in salaries and wages, um, $60,000 increase from last year. Um, you can see that retirement expense um, driving a lot of that 4% increase from FY22 budget. Um, vehicle and fuel and oil, that's a number that we're going to be reviewing. Um, we have it currently in 97 to an increase of 17,000 from prior years. Vehicle maintenance, an increase there just based on actual. Same thing with electric and gas. Insurance, we're at 97,000 for FY23. That's an increase of about $18,000 from prior budget year. And that's directly associated with the insured value on the public safety building went up after the renovations were done. So we're seeing that impact in our insurance premiums. Miscellaneous um, here, we've added um, about 17.5 to that line item to allow for increased promotional and recruitment efforts uh, uh, of our police department. I do wanna also say that insurance, that, that line item also includes liability insurance for law enforcement. That's in addition to what we pay for every other um, department. Um, so that's about, um, 
I think it's about 36,000 of that is associated with that specific liability insurance. All right, BSOs, wages and fringes. Here you can see that number hasn't changed. It's something that we're looking at. When you look at our actuals in the past couple of years, FY19, I'm, I'm talking about line item 46. I think 2019 was the first year, Chief, that we, I, I think we're fully staffed or close to fully staffed. So you see that being reflected on that total number at 93,000. Um, you can see we struggled in FY 20, 2020. Well, you know, pandemic, it was a whole different world back then. Um, seven, um, some increase in FY 21. So we're keeping that number at 88, 940, even though we've increased the hourly rates for our BSOs, um, we're still evaluating whether that need, needs to be increased even more to attract people. Um, but we feel comfortable with our actual numbers to stay to stay at the same to stay at the same rate. Certainly, our goal and effort every year is to be fully staffed. Um, but th that's the reality. We haven't been able to do that um, for quite some time. So we we feel comfortable in this number. It may change. Uh, I'm still I'm still noodling on it um, to make sure that we have enough resources there to support to support this operation. Um, capital projects um, under line item 57, IT equipment, we're replacing a computer server and backup system in the police department. So that's what that $17,000 request is for. Capital outlay, $45,000. This includes the replacement of one patrol SUV um, vehicle for, for police. Um, that number has increased from prior years just based on the cost of, of vehicles today. We had to, we were a little bit over budget this year um, from the time that it was approved by count, budgeted, approved by council, and then we went out to, to get it. Um, so we were, this reflects current numbers, if you will. New NEA tax, um, we have $5,000 here. This is a request, a new request for a livability case tracking software. This would help our um, livability officers certainly code enforcement and um, addressing uh, specifically short-term rental violations. Um, this is not, we, we haven't had anything like this and I think will help um, monitor and enforce our livability type offenses and make sure that we're keeping a track of the, the new rule that council approved about one or two years ago that um, basically has a five strikes you're out. So we wanna be able to properly track these offenses because if it ultimately ends up in the city revoking a, a, a business license or a rental license for continuing nuisance, then we wanna make sure we have a solid tracking and, um, and a, a system to, to be able to do that. So this is just a new request that's included in, in, in the budget for your consideration. And we've, ne we've never really had many cases of the five strikes or three strikes you're out, have we? We really haven't. Um, we, we have, I would say one or two or three problem air uh, homes <laughs> or uh, vacation homes but um yeah we want to be able to properly track that so that we can for right. sure say okay. yeah and, and that wasn't to say that we didn't have an issue it's yes. just that we haven't been able to effectively track it that's know? right and in the past it was a uh, it, it was more informal and it was based on um uh tickets adjudicated tickets so usually i mean that was just a very high bar um that that has changed to founded complaints. So whether a ticket is issued or not, if a, if a complaint is founded, even though if it resulted in a warning or a ticket, then, then, then it, it was a problem, right? I mean, I think we wanna separate the enforcement por portion of it on, on whether or not it's an issue. Um, so that is what we changed um, to about two years ago. All right, let's see. Um, Muni ATAX capital outlay. Here we have um, half of the license plate readers for parking enforcement. The other half you'll see in the state accommodations tax fund on the second page. 
uh, a line, uh, something I wanted to point out under muni aid tax for parking management and front beach maintenance is line 80, 80 bank service charges. You can see an increase there of 20,000. 20, That's just a, re, a, a reaction of the number of credit card transactions that we're seeing for parking um, down at Front Beach. We're seeing a lot of more of that. And, and that's something that we wanna encourage. Um, the parking kiosks are very pricey and costly to maintain and manage. And we wanna, we wanna just push people to just use their phone and their, 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 mobile, their mobile phones to paying for, um, for parking. And that will result in less cash payments and more credit card transactions. Um, and that would be just an, an, an expense that is in part offset by the parking revenues that that's, you're not seeing here in this budget. But if I re remember correctly, you're going to keep a couple of kiosks. Anyway, yes, right? the plan is to keep five yeah. rather than about 13 we have now. 18. We have 18. The plan is to keep five just so, you know, to accommodate um, non-believer of phones. Um, <laughs> um, you know, technology fails. So we want to make sure we have some, some available, you know, the availability, but really start pushing, uh, away, going away from that and more into a mobile, mobile payment system. All right. Hospitality tax. $65,000 here. Um, this includes the annual subscription for Body Worn and in Park Kramer system and the, the, the storage and retrieval system. The, in, the addition to FY23 includes a de escalation and use of force training stimulation system. That's um, $15,000. And I think we talked about this at the, in the 10 year capital plan. Um, something that our police department um, wants to be able to have for um, increased training. Currently, I think the, the Municipal Association has one that's sort of shared across the whole state, and it's very difficult to find, um, you know, the time that works for us and the availability, because I think there's only one system. Um, so this would furnish our department with their own um, training and simulation system, um, something once we have it, I encourage all of you all to, <laughs> to use. All right, capital outlay, $90,000 and a $40,000 increase from FY23. Here you can see um, we're replacing all the surveillance cameras in, at Front Beach. There's seven. Um, the recording equipment and um, installation of seven traffic counters at the connector breach inlet for $25,000. We, we maintain those? Yes, this would be our, our own traffic counter. All right, state aid tax, capital outlay line 112. We have the replacement of two patrol SUVs for 90,000. You, here you can see 50% of the cost to, to purchase a license plate reader at $60,000 and replace one LSB for 18. Then the victim's fund, this is um, state law requires that a percentage of the fines that are given um, goes to a special fund that serves victims. Um, and we use that, rep, that, that source of fund to um, support our victim's advocate by um, uh, paying a portion of her, of her phone that is what she uses to communicate with victims and um, just an other, a provision for other incidentals, um, such as towing or um, you know, whatever, whatever may be needed to support a victim of a crime on all homes. All right, that's it. <laughs> I, have, I have one question yes. for Chief Cornett. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it has to do with the uh, license plate readers you're requesting two, and um, I guess how will you use those? Because I guess the description I've heard before is that they're really for paid parking. To to keep account of that, what what will you be using them for in the interim? Since we're not anticipating increasing our paid parking out um, on the street, so they will be specifically used for parking enforcement. These will not be LPRs that you hear other departments have. Sullivan's Island has two 
coming anywhere you come on the island that read every license plate coming on. These would be different. These would be stationary on our parking enforcement vehicle, the LSVs that we're buying. Mm -hmm. I brought our new one, the little midget out outside today too, if you want to go look at it. So I drove over it. But so, yeah. it will go on, the LPR will fit onto that. It still links with our Flowbird that we're using down there. And we're trying, to, Flowbird actually offers text to park and QR code parking as well. So things that we're kind of looking into, it will still link with them. It does not link with our, our kiosks. So it still takes a little bit of work. It will alert that there is a violation. And until we get more use of Flowbird, the officer is still gonna have to check to see if they have a, a ticket in their windshield. And then if they don't, then they would issue a, a parking ticket at that time. But it, it'll work on Front Beach where we're at now. Okay, so it, you'll be going through the lots checking list as well as any on-street paid parking? Right. That's correct, yes ma'am. And in the future, as we, we transition to new parking kiosks, mm -hmm. those parking kiosks will link up with the same system so that everything will then work through those LPRs. So I'll rather than know. having them on foot, essentially mm -hmm. with a pad, this would facilitate that process. It would make it much more efficient, even in our commercial district, which is where we have paid that's, parking. That's primarily um, what you But if, if the city decides at some point to expand paid parking in other areas, this would be, you know, used for that. Um, it comes with an iPad and a printer that go in there. And as they're riding, it, it reads the tag and it goes, ding, it tells you there's a problem. If there's a problem that they're in fact parked unlawfully, you just hit a button, the ticket prints out for you, you stick it in there and you, you move on. Uh, so it should expedite the, the work for our officers and help them out a little bit. And I think it's gonna be a great move for us. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So you all will have an opportunity to see this um, with any, revisions i don't anticipate many from now on but um at our budget workshop in mid-march we will have a discussion about just all operational budgets so you'll have an opportunity to see other departments and provide feedback or ask questions at that time as well what is the um overall increase in percentage for the two department for each department Terms of I I have it by by fund. Um, when we have the final when we have the final full draft, it'll have at the bottom that those differences. So we typically wait until we're, we're we feel more comfortable with the first draft before we do that. Um, but right now, you can kind of aggregate by by section. That's it's included here, and the the, the percentage that you're comparing to <coughs> is compared to FY twenty two budget. As we get closer to a final version of the budget, I like seeing how that translates or how that um, differentiates from our forecast, where we're, we're actually going to end up. Um, so we either add a column that shows that or just change that percentage. Um, I'm still not sure what I, I want to see yet. <laughs> so you'd have a FY22 budgeted, FY22 actual. And then the yes. FY23 budget. Well, well, right now you can see the F in, in blue in that middle section of the yeah. budget. You can so we have the actuals for prior the prior four years, and then for the current fiscal year, you'll see the budget year to date for six months, the 12 months, which is a lot of what we look at when we yes. when we're making forecasting decisions. And then you'll see the forecast where we anticipate ending up. We're still, you know, four months before the end of this fiscal year. So that number will be adjusted, adjusted as we go along. If you think of anything between now and then, do not hesitate to give me a call and we'll walk through. It's a lot of information. It is a lot of information. <laughs> Thank you. That was and we try to be very specific in the notes on the mm -hmm. second page so that you know exactly what's new, what's different, where's the, where's the difference. So just spend some time looking at the notes. I think it's, they're, they're, they're specific to, to, to be able to provide context um, for these purchases and requests. Okay, Are there any other comments, questions? Not on the budget, I've got one other thing I just wanted to ask Desiree. Mm -hmm. um, we got an email this week from Mr. Naylor about traffic or stop signs on, 25th Avenue. 
and it, it went to you and uh, to all oh, of us. Yeah. The question is who who actually handles that? Where does that go? Do we need to follow up on that, or is that something that will automatically be looked at? I th the request was to add. I, I'm not yeah, the, recalling. On on waterway in 25th, the stop sign is on the waterway traffic. Yes, and it's a free flow on the on 25th on the avenue. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he's concerned, and I agree with him mm -hmm. that yeah. we probably need a four way stop. Or reverse it one of the two mm -hmm. because it's the only avenue where the stop sign goes that way. Yes, that's so that's that's something I'll discuss with um, Chief Cornett and um, make that request to SADOT. Um, it's a DOT road, and just like we, we, right. we, the stop sign that was installed at 41st Avenue, we've made that request. So we'll we'll take that on at staff level and get that get that underway. Wasn't that originally set up that way because we were times launching emergency vehicles from the end of 25th? I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, know. That for a fact. I, it's, it's more anecdotal than anything, <laughs> but, I, but I, my understanding that it's sometime in the past they would have had that as going all the way down to the water just to accommodate yeah. emergency mm. vehicles. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look into all of that. I, I don't know if yeah. that's the case. In, in my opinion, it's pretty dangerous because traffic on waterway is is um, normally given the right of way and right. so traffic on 25th would would come out expecting waterway to stop and they might not mm -hmm. or waterway would expect 25th to stop well, you'll always see clarify. me stop there yeah <laughs> completely yeah, i know so you need to <laughs> clarify it. yeah make yeah. it a four-way stop in my yeah, opinion no, no. we'll likely just Great. admit this is a request for a dot traffic engineer yes. to look into and make a recommendation yeah absolutely Thank you. Okay. Any other comments, questions? No, oh, ma'am. Nope. All right. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for 10 a.m. Thursday, April 7th. Is there any other business? Motion to adjourn. adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Great. Almost an hour. <laughs>